Good evening, everyone. Uh, respected Speaker of the Evening, Sri Shatish Kumar, Vice President Chetan, uh, Mukesh Bhai, Office Bearers, Past Presidents of the Society, uh, friends who have come from out of Mumbai, uh, guests and student <coughs> friends. I welcome you all to this public lecture meeting on ethical and environmental aspects of the economy uh, by Mr. Satish Kumar. Uh, for those who are attending the program of the Society for the first time, uh, Bombay Chartered Accountant Society was formed in 1949 to promote ongoing professional education for chartered accountants in the field of accountancy, taxation, and allied subjects. However, that is not all that we do, and that's not all that we wish to carry out. It is our vision that we bring about better policies and laws and help professionals become good citizens too not only for our country, but for the universe at large, so that our members can open up to deeper and broader dimensions that life has to offer, so that we can learn, serve, and make contribution to our society. In that context, the society organizes seminars, workshop, residential programs, brings out publications, and also runs a foundation dedicated to our philanthropic activities, specifically in the field of the right of in the field of right to information. Normally, Wednesday lecture meetings are on subjects linked to tax, audit, governance, etc. Yet there are subjects that go way beyond areas that chartered accountants in practice uh, are familiar with. There are certain subjects which are way deeper, way bigger than balance sheets and profit and loss accounts. However, there is that something which is more fundamental than just the assets that produce goods and services or the profit that everyone seems to be wanting more and more. That's something which is so fundamental to our existence and yet we take it for granted and do not pay enough attention to it. Over the last few hundred years, humanity has generated massive amount of knowledge and reportedly made unimaginable progress previously not known to our race. At the same time, if you look at the number of killings, say in wars, in last few hundred years, a human killing another human, that is also a record of sorts. Let alone human killing other humans as species supposedly with very high level of intelligence, and as Satish Ji was telling us in the Jain philosophy, they have, you know, one Indriya, and, you know, humans have five senses, and we are supposed to be the pinnacle of all evolution. We still have been very violent through our behavior, individually or collectively, whether advertently or deliberately, destroying other living organisms and systems at a pace like never before. Therefore, the business community has tremendous onus to pay huge amount of attention. And even as individual citizens, we have an onus to pay great attention not only to looking at profit, especially businesses who look for profit quarter after quarter, but on environmental and ethical aspects of economy that are fundamental to human coexistence. The wisdom of the Indian tradition, and it's often found in Sanskrit couplets, uh, which I kind of like and I would like to share one. And they're really filled with a lot of beauty and meaning. And one of them, and some of you would have heard about it in other writings and talks, uh, is this two words which says, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. And that's very common, a lot of us know about it, which says the whole world is one family, that all of us are connected, we all are you know one. When we look at that whole verse, and this is just the last uh, two words of that full verse, its meaning is that for the one who is constricted in his mindset, considers some, some people to be related to him, some people as belonging to him, whereas others he considers as, you know, far away, disconnected, you know, the other. Whereas the one who is of expansive consciousness considers the entire universe as nothing but his own family. Where they use the word udar charitanam. 
And Satish Kumar ji, the speaker of the day, I feel is one of those persons who is someone with expansive consciousness, who walks the earth with great generosity. Udar Charit, the word Charit comes from the Sanskrit word Char, which means to move, and to move with that expansive consciousness. Satish ji has made incredible contribution to setting a goal a global agenda for change, a change to stop damage to social, ecological, and economic facets of our society. And he has a very interesting uh, bio data, and I would like to share a few features from that. At age nine, he became a Jain sadhu. At age 18, he left the mendicant's order to become a student of Vinoba Bhave, uh, one of the most notable Gandhian reformer. And as a nuclear disarmament advocate, he walked to Moscow, Paris, London, and Washington, D.C. on foot, covering about 8,000 miles, but not just that, without any money in his pocket, and depending solely on the kindness and hospitality of strangers, as if we can call them that. That only proves that the world really is one family. He's the editor of Resurgence magazine since 1973, making him the UK's longest serving editor of the same magazine. He has been guiding spirit behind numerous environmental and educational ventures, such as the Schumacher College International Center for Ecological Studies and the Small School. Schumacher College, for those of you who do not know, focuses on interactive, experimental, and participatory learning and offers practical skills and strategic and deliberate thinking required to face the ecological, economic, and social challenges of the 21st century. He has been a contributor to the BBC programs, including a film, Earth, Pil Earth Pilgrim, for BBC Two's Natural History series. He has written extensively and inspired many who are here, including people who have come from out of Mumbai. His autobiography, No Destination, was first published in 1978 and has sold 50,000 copies worldwide. One of his other wonderful books is You Are, Therefore I Am, A Declaration of Dependence. That talks about relationships and connections between all things. He teaches, he continues to teach and run workshops on reverential ecology, holistic education, and voluntary simplicity, and is much sought after speaker both in UK and abroad. Satish lives in the UK, and our common friend Andrew just told us that he is turning 80 this year. We are indeed privileged and honored to have you with us, and we are grateful that you agreed to spend this time with us. Uh, I will request Chetan, our Vice President, to present a small memento as a mark of our appreciation and regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Friends, please join me in welcoming Satish. It's okay. I'll stand there. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, many thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk to accountants, <laughs> which is not that often that I do. <clears throat> and also many thanks for such wonderful welcome and such a long introduction to informing everybody about my life and my work. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here and, and, and be present and talk with you. And maybe we will have some time for questions. I'll speak for half an hour or 35 minutes and so that we have plenty of time. And you can challenge me, you can question anything you like. That would be a good uh, dialogue. I'll prefer that. But environmental and ethical dimension of economy is a very important uh, subject to discuss. Um, as you heard that I was a Jain monk, my guru was Acharya Tulsi, and I became a monk at age nine. And at age 18, 
I read a book by Mahatma Gandhi. It was his autobiography. And in this autobiography, it was the one thing which really stood out for me is that in order to practice spirituality, you don't have to forsake the world. Spirituality is not only for the monks. And how many people can become monks? Not everybody can become monks. So that means that you are making spirituality, which means ethical, spiritual, environmental issues, for a small, ex ex exclusive group of people. So ethics and spirituality should be available to everyone, whatever you are doing. Spirituality should be in politics, in economics, in business, in agriculture, in education, in home, in office, wherever you are. Now, what makes your work ethical? The ethical dimension of economics, or politics, or agriculture, whatever it is, what makes the same work either ethical and spiritual or just material and worldly <coughs> is the intention is the motivation so if you are in business you can be in business purely for money or for status for power you want to be appreciated for your ego. Then whatever you are doing, your business or your politics, is not spiritual, not ethical. But if you are in politics or in business, industry, education, agriculture, whatever you are doing, if you are doing it in the service of humanity, then that's a good business. Your business is a spiritual practice. Because what is business? Business is to bring goods and services to people. We need food. We need farmers to produce food. Why are you producing food? You can produce food to make money. Or you can produce food to feed people in the service of humanity. You can produce food caring for the soil, caring for the environment, caring for the animals. Or you can produce food with chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides and factory farms, animals in confinement because it makes quick profit. Doesn't matter what happens to the environment. Doesn't happen if the land is polluted. Doesn't matter if the, if the oceans are polluted. Doesn't matter if the rivers are polluted. Doesn't matter if the air is polluted. I don't care. As long as I make profit, it's all I'm in for. Mahatma Gandhi said, when he wrote his autobiography at that time, before we became aware of the environment and ecology, he said at that time that if your motivation is purely making profit, then you don't care. Neither you care for people, nor you care for the land, the animals, the forests, the rivers, the soil. But the moment you say, I will produce food to feed the people, but in the way that it, it enhances the soil, enriches the soil, 
animals are kept in good care. The forests are kept in good care. The air is still clean. I will not harm, I mean, non-violence. Mahatma Gandhi's principle was non-violence. So a non-violent economy, ethical economy, environmental economy is a kind of non-violent economy. We do violence to nature if we subjugate nature for the human benefit only. And, and that benefit is just a financial benefit. If you subjugate nature for just the financial benefit or even your name, fame, ego, prestige, power, control, then your economy is violent economy. Neither environmentally sustainable, nor ethically uh, enriching, nor fulfilling. Even though you have become millionaire or billionaire, you are not happy in your heart. What have I done all my life? At the age when I reach, like my age, 80, when you are a businessman, an accountant, in your young age of 30s and 40s and 50s, and when you come to 70s and 80s, you look back in your life. What have I done? I earned lots of money in the bank. So what? What have I done to people? What have I done to nature? What have I done to animals? When you ask that question, you are not dying happily. You are not going to the other world feeling that I have served the humanity, feeling I have done my best to keep the harmony between humans and nature, humans and the environment. So that Mahatma Gandhi's writing inspired me. And I said, I don't have to practice spirituality only as a monk in a monastic order, keeping my mouth with a little mask and, and a brush in my hand to brush the ants from the floor. But somebody is producing food for me. Somebody is producing clothes for me. Somebody is building houses for me. And I said, no, no, I'm non-violent. I'm not doing anything. And so I decided to leave the monastic order and joined Gandhian movement, led by Vinoba Bhave at that time. And ever since, I have been on this journey, on this journey of finding a way of living in the world, which is spiritually, ethically, ecologically, environmentally enhancing, enhancing. And so, what we are, humans, we have a kind of idea, never mind the profit and money, even beyond that, the humans have idea that the entire natural world is there for the use of human beings. The animals are there for humans to consume. The forests are there for humans to cut down, build houses. The oceans are there for humans to fish or to, to cross the oceans in ships. The nature is there for humans' use. And we think the humans are a superior species and all the other species are our servants. They are our slaves. And we are somehow at the top of the evolution. It's like uh, at the time of British Empire, the British thought that the British are the best and the whole world should be our colony. Or at the time of the slavery, the humans thought that some humans can be slaves and they can be bought and sold from Africa particularly slaves went to Europe and to America. So like human, and even in India, we have this kind of idea that certain classes of untouchables or lower class are there to serve the upper class. So that is, you can say, casteism or nationalism or racism 
You can call it racism. One race is superior to another race. So uh, in America, I met Martin Luther King when he was campaigning against racialism and say, white race is superior to black race. At, at certain time in history, even now maybe, uh, there is a kind of um, superiority complex among men. And they think men are somehow superior to women. Women should be in the service of their husbands or their fathers, men. This kind of sexism, racism, nationalism, these isms, I think fortunately there are movements in our human world and we are slowly, gradually, one way or the other, being free, freeing ourselves from this idea that uh, male superiority over female, and now we are saying male, female, equal. One caste superior to another caste, Brahmin superior to untouchables. We are now in the constitution at least say that no, no, all Indians, all humans are equal. The slaves, black people, and slaves, we are saying now you can't buy and sell humans. So that change has taken place. But as far as nature and human superiority and inferiority is concerned, we are still suffering from the idea of speciesism, what I call like racism, human species superior to all other species around the world. And that has led us to do what we like in the world of nature, environment. We can cut down the rainforest, which are the lungs of the earth. If you have all the rainforest gone, rain will be gone. We are, uh, um, we are emitting greenhouse gases in the environment and causing global warming, climate change. Now you can, you can see Mumbai is very hot even in sort of um, this, uh, early April. And uh, somewhere in Orissa, I read somewhere uh, that already 40, 45 degree um, temperature and uh, uh, schools are being closed and offices are being closed and so so hot that you can't go out to work. Already we are, who has done it? We, this idea that somehow human beings can do to nature what we like. This is our right to use nature for human profit and human benefit. So we have been polluting our water. We have been poisoning our land with chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides. We think soil is dead. Soil has no fertility. We have to bring these chemicals and artificial, uh, um, uh, artificial um, um, uh, fertilizers in order to create uh, fertility. But if you go to forests, there are no chemicals and the forests are growing. Where do they get fertility from? Soil is alive. Soil is full of life. Soil is intelligent. Soil has a soul, my dear friends. Remember, soil has soul, jiva. Soil has memory. A mango seed has a memory. When you plant that mango seed in the soil, it will not become an apple and forget that, oh, I was mango or was I apple. I can't remember. It didn't become a pear or it didn't become papaya. It didn't become anything else. It remembers to remain a mango, and when it grows, it becomes a mango. It has a memory. Nature is sacred, but we have forgotten that. And so what I think we need to do is to challenge this notion of human speciesism, human superiority, and we have to say, we are part of nature. Nature is not out there. We are nature. You know the word nature in English comes from Latin word natura. And natura uh, is the root word, takes, becomes the word nature, natal, native, nation. <coughs> All these words come from the same root. Now, what does natal mean? When a mother is pregnant, when you were pregnant with Sangeeta, mother there sitting, you will go for a prenatal check. Natal. 
postnatal check, midwife will come after the birth of your daughter and check if you're all right. Postnatal check. Natal means birth. So, same root, nature. Nature means birth. Everything what is born is nature. So we are nature too. We are made of all the natural Panchamahabhutas, all the natural elements. We are made of earth. Our body is earth. You eat mangoes, you eat cauliflower, you eat um, wheat, chapatis, rice. Where did it come from? What is it? What is rice? Rice is pure soil transformed into grain. So what we are made of earth. But air, air is not just out there. We cannot live without air for a second or for a minute. Unless you are a samadhi doing yogi, maybe you are doing pranayama. But normally we breathe every second of the time. We are air. We are water. 70% of human body is water. And we think water is nothing. We can pollute the river, we can pollute the ocean. Doesn't matter. Some uh, municipal or some corporation from Mumbai will clean the water for us and bring us in the tap. That's all we have to care about. Doesn't matter what we do. All our industrial pollution can go in the Ganges, Jamuna, uh, Kaveri, Narmada. Doesn't matter. We have forgotten that we are nature. If we pollute our, our water, we have to drink it. If we pollute our environment and our air and global warming, we have to, to smell that and we have to breathe that air. We have, if we pollute the soil, we have to eat that food. And so what we do to nature, we do to ourselves. We have forgotten it. And therefore humanity is living in a kind of cloud cuckoo land that we can go on doing what we do to this earth. This is finite earth, planet earth is only a small planet home. You just heard Vasudeva Kutumbakam. So Udar Charitana Amdu Vasudeva Kutumbakam. So whole earth is one family. We have forgotten this. And we only think that making profit is the only thing. And so um, I was um, invited to speak, like you have kindly invited me here. I was invited to speak at the London School of Economics in London. And when I arrived there, I asked the learned professor, you are London School of Economics? Please take me, also show me, where is your department for ecology? The learned professor said, what do you mean ecology? We are a school of economics. We don't study ecology. I said, Madam Professor, do you know the meaning of the word ecology and economy? What do you mean? Economy means finance. Economy means the economy, money. I said, no. Economy is a very beautiful word. Eco, it comes from Greek language. Eco, word comes from ekos. And ekos means home. So in the wisdom of the Greek philosophers, the entire planet is our home. Earth home, planet home. So the birds in the sky are our brothers and sisters. Family, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the Indian philosophers knew it. The, uh, the forest dwelling animals like tigers and elephants and the deer and all the animals in the wild forest, they are our brothers and sisters. How we live in harmony with all the species around the world. That is ecos. And nomos means management. So managing your planet home is economy. Economy, dear accountants and financiers and, and, uh, and, uh, and economists, please understand economy does not mean finance or money or business management. Economy means managing your planet home. Please understand the meaning of the word. Don't corrupt the meaning of the word. And then I said, and you understand the, the word ecology? Again, ecos means home, planet home, earth home. And logos means like logic, logistics, knowledge. So knowledge of home is ecology. Management of home is economy. Now you are teaching your students economy. 
how to manage your home. But you don't teach them what is home, no knowledge. Please tell me, how are you going to manage something you don't know? Can you manage something you don't know? So you must teach ecology and economy together. It's like walking on two legs. If you go just economy, 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 managing, 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 and you don't know what you are managing, you create a mess. No wonder that the world economy is in a mess because it's being managed by your graduates who are passing your exams to this famous World University of London School of Economics. They are going to Africa, India, China, America, South America, everywhere, managing economy and making a mess. All the environment polluted, all the rivers polluted, Amazon forests going, animals in prisons, in factory farms. What are we doing to this planet Earth? We are cutting the branch upon which we are sitting. We are destroying the natural world which feeds us, waters us, clothes us. Banks, all your money, money is not in the banks, money is in all your computers. It's a figure. It's an imaginative idea, a very good idea. Money is a very good invention as a servant for the humanity and the planet Earth to make life convenient and easy, exchanging goods and services. But now, what was a good tool, a good servant to help Humans had become the master. And everything we do, producing food is not to feed people. Producing food is to make profit. Making clothes is not to clothe the people, but to make profit. Build a house, not to house people, but to make profit. Educate at schools and universities, not to um, educate young people, but to make profit. Everything had become part of profit. Money had become the master of humanity. And you accountants are keeping all those accounts, okay, account books. But take, take nature into account. Capital is not capital which is your, you have inherited from your parents. Nature is the true capital. If you destroy the capital of nature and then you have a kind of money capital managing, not wisdom. That's not human wisdom. So that wisdom is lost. This is what Mahatma Gandhi said, that do your business, your politics, your economics, your accounting, your education, your agriculture, whatever you do with a different motivation, different intention, where you take care of yourself, spiritual practice, do yoga, do meditation, eat good food, have good sleep, do exercise, look after yourself, be happy. That's a part of spirituality. Then you act with other human, other human beings, society, take care, like you take care of yourself. Like Jesus Christ said 2,000 years ago, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So take care of your neighbors, take care of your family, take care of your customers. When the customer comes to your bank or your, your accounts office or your shop, you say, welcome. Thank you for um, giving us this pleasure and an honor to serve you. We are in your service. <coughs> That's the kind of quality of spirit that we need to bring into our business. And then take care of your environment. Because the bigger, bigger home is your environment, your uh, oceans, the Bombay, you are by the ocean, and your rivers, and your land, and your soil, and your, your air all the things that I have spoken about. So if we can have that kind of big vision that humanity can be happy and joyful and at ease with itself. Mahatma Gandhi said, there's enough in the world for everybody's need, but not enough for anybody's greed. Anybody's greed. At the moment, our societies, every country, it's not just India, it's not just Mumbai, London, Tokyo, New York, America, South America, Africa, South Africa, Russia, China, every country, all the nearly 200 nations in the world are driven by economic growth. They have no other purpose. Our prime minister, our finance minister, our head of the um, uh, uh, central bank or, or reserve bank, whoever they are, they are all driven by one purpose only. Where have we gone so down? that money has become the master of Mr. Modi. Money has, economic growth has become the master of our uh, head of Reserve Bank. Uh, the money has become the master of everybody. Buddha, forget him. Mahavir, forget him. Vishnu, 
Krishna, Rama, anything, forget them. Money, money, money. What has gone to humanity? Where is that wisdom? And so ethical and environmental dimension of economy has become urgent. Now we need it, otherwise this planet is in peril. Our earth, our forests, our rivers, our air, everything is in peril. But still time, still time. And responsibility is not on Mr. Modi. Responsibility is not on somebody else. Each and every one of us have to say, what food I'm buying? Is this the right kind of food I'm eating? What kind of clothes am I buying? Is the right kind of clothes? Has it polluted the environment? If your clothes, your saris are made in China, how those saris will come to England, India? It will be used by fossil fuel, which will create greenhouse gases. When transporting from Mumbai to Kolkata, Kolkata to Mumbai, Bangalore to uh, Mumbai, Mumbai to Bangalore, Delhi to uh, Mumbai, Mumbai to Delhi, all this transporting goods and services all around flying is creating global warming. So we have to change, think again, and change our way of life so that we can develop ecologically sound, waste-free, pollution-free economy. Economy is a good thing, it's a beautiful word, but has become corrupted. So economy is a good thing, we have to manage the planet Earth ecologically, knowing that the whole Earth and all the species upon this Earth are supporting each other. Soil supports humans, but humans have to support soil. Forest supports humans, they give us fruit. Mangoes give us mangoes, but we have to look after the mango trees. If we destroy the mango trees, we will not have mangoes. So we have to take care of nature as nature takes care of us. It's very simple. Uh, what I'm saying to you is not a rocket science. What I'm speaking to you is not something uh, deep philosophy of Upanishads or Bhagavad Gita. Common sense, ecological and ethical dimension of economy is a common sense. But unfortunately, common sense is no longer common. So we have to have this meeting and you have to invite me to remind you what we have forgotten. You know it. What I'm speaking to you is nothing new. What I have said to you is not something that you don't know, but we have forgotten it. We have put it aside. We have said, oh, I can't be bothered to think about environment. I can't be bothered to think about ethical dimension. I have to pass this bill or I have to do these accounts and I have to meet the deadline. We have become so narrowly focused that we have forgotten the big picture. So, um, so in nutshell, what I'm saying to you is, that ethical and environmental dimension of economy is not a luxury. It is not something for tomorrow. It is not something as a kind of uh, a philosophical notion. It is not something like a, a kind of theory. It is not. It is an urgent issue for everyday life, for every human being. It's not an issue for America. It's not an issue for United Nations. It's not an issue for um, government in Delhi or government in Mumbai, Maharashtra government. It's for every human being. We have to take responsibility and say, every day we will think about environment. Every day we'll think about ethical issues. Every day all my activities will be informed by deeper values. And then of course money is no problem. Money has been a good invention to help and facilitate and, 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 and ease our communication and our goods and services of exchange. It was a good invention. It has a place but it must be kept in its place. It's a place that is to serve humanity and serve the earth and not rule the humanity and rule the earth. That's the only difference uh, between um, making money as a master or making money as a servant. If we can do that, then I think we have beautiful world, beautiful planet earth, beautiful country of India, but all countries, I live in the UK, beautiful country. We have so beautiful water flowing. So rain comes to every house. It doesn't need any fossil fuel. The clouds bring rain to every field. Uh, sun is everywhere. You don't need nuclear power, but sun has thousand or million nuclear powers are in the sun. We don't need anything. Rain, sun, soil, trees, forest, animals, birds, insects, Earthworms everywhere. Nature has provided so much wealth and we have forgotten. 
And we think wealth is how much money I have in my bank. That's the wealth. Money is not wealth. Money is only a measure of wealth. The real wealth is our trees, our land, our soil, our animals, our people, their skills, builders building beautiful houses, their skills, people making beautiful furniture, people making beautiful clothes, their skills, communities. That is real wealth. Money is only a measure of wealth, a convenient method of doing it. And then we can be good accountants and count the money, no problem. I have no complaint about accountants, but this philosophy that we have forgotten, that money has become our master, and the, and the environment, we are prepared to sacrifice our environment. And we are prepared to sacrifice our ethical values in order to make money and be rich. I think that will not lead us either to happiness or to sustainability. So these are common sense values that I am reminding you and I hope that uh, you will consider and think about this. But if you have any questions, please do challenge me uh, because I might be a bit too idealistic or too flaky, wishy-washy. So do challenge me and ask any questions or comments. But again, thank you for inviting me and giving me this chance to express some of my passion and some of my views. Thank you very much. Mike is works, but anyway, you are asking about GDP growth. So, the world in a finite world, in finite growth, yeah. Is yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, your question is absolutely right. Um, all the governments and, <coughs> and businesses are focusing on economic growth without end unlimited economic growth. You are absolutely right. We are on a finite planet. You cannot have infinite growth. But also economic growth is a very crude measure. Recently, in the United Kingdom, they had a minus economic growth. And so government thought, that how can we present this data to people? Uh, they will say that government is not doing good job of having minus economic growth. So they say, what can we do? How can we solve this problem? So they included crime and prostitution as part of economic activity. So economic growth includes, if you have an accident, and money, doctors flying, helicopters flying, um, uh, all the things happening, people are being, into, being brought to hospital, that is part of GDP. We have, you put more and more people in prison, part of GDP. And now in the United Kingdom, they are also including prostitution as a part of GDP. GDP is not a measure of good economic management. GDP is only a crude measure of money moving from one place to another. So this idea, this obsession that China has nine point economic growth GDP, India has only 7%, why are we lagging behind? We have to compete with China, we have to get 9.5 or 10 point economic growth or GDP growth. 
that's a complete mistaken uh, kind of notion which the whole world has somehow uh, become uh, prone to. So I say you are, your question is absolutely right, that we have to rise above this crude measure of GDP and find a true measure of shifting from GDP and economic growth to growth in well-being. So we have to measure, somehow we have to find a way of measuring, are people more healthy? Are people more happy? Are children being educated properly? If people are using less medicine and doing more exercise and are less breaking communities, less breakdown in families, those are the measure of well-being. So instead of growth in GDP, we need to have growth in well-being. That would be a good measure. So I agree with you that GDP is not the right kind of measure. I don't know your microphone is working, I can't hear you. Speak louder, speak louder. Hello? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, gross sexual happiness. Yeah. 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 They say that you know uh, protecting the, the protected area of Bhutan yeah. uh, should be any time uh, more than 60%. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, land area. That's right. So, which are other countries who have uh, such uh, norms in their constitution uh, or, or you know, for protection of uh, forest area? Yeah. There are some smaller countries like Costa Rica in South, um, South America. And uh, there are one or two smaller countries in Africa. They are looking into um, gross national happiness idea. But Bhutan is, I think, the best example uh, by far. Uh, when King of Bhutan, before it was democracy even, was at the United Nations, and uh, a journalist from the uh, New York Times asked him, uh, Your Majesty, what is your GDP of Bhutan? And he answered, I don't care so much about GDP, gross domestic product. I'm more interested in gross national happiness. That was his answer. And from that time, Bhutan is, I think, the only country apart from Costa Rica. Costa Rica is also completely free. They renounced the arms, <coughs> military, and completely local economy and ecological economy. That's another country. But Bhutan is the best example, and they have a constitution. Uh, there are one or two other countries in South America, maybe Bolivia, uh, where they have constitution in which they have given rights to nature. So it's not only human rights, but rights of nature, rights of animals, rights of forests, rights of indigenous people. They have protected. So there are one or two countries, but not many. Most countries, particularly leading countries, America, Russia, China, India, Europe, all these countries are all wedded to GDP and economic growth. And Bhutan, small country with less than one million people, how much voice, how much power they have. So I think we have to have India leading in ecological and ethical economy. Then, because we have such a tremendous history, India, our country, has such a you know, great tradition. Um, Mahatma Gandhi's economy and, and uh, many, many other uh, people who have developed good, strong um, uh, philosophy and economy. If we can show another way of economic uh, growth, which is more related to well-being, and not GDP, then I think uh, uh, more powerful. Bhutan is a small country and not have so much influence. However, it's a ex good example for us to emulate. Sir, my question is about agriculture. All people say that we should be for the one for natural farming. But the government say that unless we use chemicals and fertilizers, there will be no enough food for feeding the people. What is your view? We will not be able to feed people. Yeah, yeah. I think we have been brainwashed. Brainwashed by the chemical industry. 
they have to sell their fertilizers and therefore they advertise and they say if you want to feed people you have to use chemicals otherwise your growth will be productive will be small but this I, in my view is a complete brainwashing propaganda in order to sell the chemicals uh, I have seen many many examples of organic farming all around the world per capita growth of food production of food is higher on organically farmed land than per capita production of chemically farmed land but where they win is no no sorry per acre and per capita so per acre is higher if you organically farm per, per capita is higher if you do chemically because people are taken away from the land they say working on the land is only if you are backward uneducated um, poor um, then you work on the land but if you are rich and you're powerful, a big landlord, then you use tacticals, combined harvesters, and, and a kind of machines. So that you don't need to do farming. You don't need to touch the soil. You don't need to do any hard work. Machines will do it, chemicals will do it. So you, instead of five people working on one acre, you have one person working on 200 acres. So one person working on 200 acres per capita income is higher from the land. But if you take 200 acres, farmed by the people, then the production of, of, of food on that land is higher. So this is the big confusion. What we need, and you people living in Mumbai maybe uh, are not so connected with the land, but we need to develop respect for farmers. And this idea that if you are only uneducated, backward um, uh, people, then you farm. But if you are educated, university graduate, then you work in an office and sit in a nice air-conditioned room and sit in front of a computer and, and uh, do your computer kind of figuring and internet and all that. Then you are educated and you are in a work in a bank or in an accounts office. You are paid maybe um, uh, maybe uh, one lakh or or, or 50,000 rupees um, a month or a year, but if you are farming, you are paid 10,000 or 20,000 or 25,000 rupees. Why? Is food production so unimportant? No one, we can live without so-called money um, figures on the computer, but we cannot live one day without food. Whether you are in Bombay or Kol uh, Kolkata or New York or London or wherever you are, even if you go to moon, you take food with you. And food is produced by farmers. So we need to give dignity to farmers. We need to give respect to farmers. We need to pay more to the farmers. Because farm, and we should try to keep people on the land, produce food is important as it is important to work in uh, Mumbai or Kolkata or Delhi uh, in a city. I'm not against cities, but the balance between country and city must be maintained. And we must, city people must not think that working in the villages, working on the land is backward, uneducated, stupid people do agriculture and clever people work in the banks or in the accounts office. This kind of division and thinking is wrong, in my view. We must give dignity and respect to farmers and, and also when you are educated, still, I mean, I love gardening. My mother was a farmer and I, I have two acres and I garden. I have 15 apple trees. I, have, I grow strawberries, raspberries, um, apples, um, uh, um, potatoes, carrots, asparagus, um, you name it. I grow the cabbages, the cauliflowers, carrots, everything I grow. I love it. Why uneducated, backward person should work on the land and educated, clever people should be only in the office? This kind of division is wrong. So I think this chemical idea and a fertilizer idea, the soil is dead. Soil has no fertility and we have to put these chemicals and, and, and artificial fertilizers into the soil to grow food. It's a complete brainwashing which has been going on for the last 50 years. And government has sold it, business has sold it, everybody sitting in the offices and say, how can, we don't want to work, let the tractors work and let the chemicals do producing of food and farmers don't want to work. So it's a kind of cop-out we have created. And so we need to re-educate ourselves and say, 
farm because soil is alive soil has fertility the real fertilizer is the earthworm under the soil and we have killed the earthworms through our chemicals and fertilizers but earthworms turn six tons of soil every month they are working day and night and never go on strike never ask for any wages never go for a weekend away they are working under the soil we have killed them real workers earthworms we have killed them and and these business people uh, producing fertilizers and chemicals which come from the oil for which we have to go to saudi arabia prime minister has to go to saudi arabia to make some deal with them which is a kind of dictatorial very um, undemocratic country but we have to keep good terms with them so they are producing for, uh, oil for us so it's a complete nonsense to say that organic farming is no good and chemicals and fertilizers will feed the world or or uh, genetically engineered seeds will feed the world i think that's a complete uh, wrong notion in my view So business is supplying goods and service to people. So if you are totally for the genuine needs of the people, how many businesses can we really support? I mean, business is to uh, bring people. goods and services to each other so certain amount of business is necessary my mother was a farmer but my father was a businessman and he said i do business to make friends and serve humanity and that's a good notion so certain amount how much business is a good question and 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 there's no fixed answer to that because what can you say maybe 10% 15% of people should be engaged in business and in my view at least 50 60% of people should be engaged in growing food even if you are a business person like i'm an editor i'm a writer i've written books i'm a, a, a lecturer in a university and yet i am engaged in growing food i think even if you are an accountant it's a good that you have a little bit of um land even in a small uh, garden or even if you don't have in mumbai maybe gardens are more difficult even in your balcony you go some grow some tomatoes or some herbs or some tulsi or some other things and make make compost now in uh, in uh, bangalore i was delighted to visit um uh, a, 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 an organization called they produce these pots beautiful handmade clay pots called daily drop yeah. have you eh? daily dump daily dump daily dump that's yeah. right is in mumbai as well yeah, yeah. very good very good so please buy a daily dump pot and put all your kitchen waste in there you can make soil in mumbai you don't have to go to your villages in mumbai with your cauliflower leaves your mango peels your banana peels your orange peels any kitchen waste put in that uh, daily dump and within 3 uh, uh, weeks 4 weeks and they even give you some advice how to make it they put some little bit of this and that it's a beauty i i would delight to visit their headquarters in bangalore so even in uh, mumbai you are doing business you are an accountant you are in a bank you are whatever you are doing stay in touch with your nature touch the soil without the soil we are not humans human means soil soil and human come from the same root the the latin word is humus 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 is soil soil and also hum, humil humility come from the same root humanity humility humus come from the same root latin we have forgotten without soil there is no human without humility there is no human so but we have become so arrogant we think humans are so clever so special we can fly the aeroplanes we can go to the moon we can make a, a nuclear weapons we are so clever what is so clever in destroying the planet earth 
What is so clever in keeping millions of people in starvation? What is so clever in thinking farmers are stupid, backward, uneducated people, let them work on the land, but real farming is factory farming? It's not clever. So, human, humus, humility, same root. Remember the language. We have forgotten the meaning and we have become so arrogant. Human has to be humble. Humility and humanity go together. And so, uh, business is good, but business by itself is no good if it is not made by craftsmen and women making clothes and people who are making pots and people who are building houses and people who are growing food. When there are no products, what is good of business? When people do just business in money and accounts and money making money, stock exchange and so on, that's not real business. The real business is when you honor the producer and bring the product to those who are need consuming and, and, and vice versa. And all consumers should also be makers. Why only consumer? I am a consumer and maker at the same time. I consume what I don't produce, but I produce for the consumption of others. So we can all be consumers and we can all be makers. That is my vision of the future. I just need a solution from you. Yes. The solution which I'm looking out is that uh, people who are concerned about the environment, about the ecology, and sustainable development, as you say, uh, are in a very, very stark minority. Very small. You know, countries like Bhutan, uh, uh, Costa Rica, very few. And uh, countries which have exploited nature, which work tremendously and are today leading the entire world. Yeah. And uh, even uh, when we are talking about development in our own country, yeah. it comes uh, at the cost of the environment. Yeah. And environmentalists are considered as one of the biggest stumbling block in the way of development. Yeah. How do we marry this ecology and as we understand it now together? Yeah, yeah. That's the solution. Yeah, it is a big question. It's a very important question and a big question. Uh, but we have to also remember that countries are made of not just governments, not just business leaders, not just industrialists, not just bankers, also many, many other people. And in India, all over India, there are tremendous, great projects going on. In Andhra Pradesh, millions of acres of land in organic farming. There are Deccan um, <coughs> Development Society where women are working on organic farming and sustainable agriculture and sustainable uh, business. Uh, all over India, there is a beautiful website called Vikalp Sangam. Have a look at this. How many projects? And the person who put me in touch with you here is Vandana Shiva. She has got a Navdanya uh, organic movement. And there are something like uh, I think 100,000 members of Navdanya organic farm movement. So uh, Rajendra Singh in Rajasthan producing, uh, making jodas for uh, storing water. Um, um, there are people all over India doing wonderful projects and we have to honor them, support them, uh, cherish them uh, and, and appreciate them. So. But there are still in India many, many farmers working on the land, producing good food. There are many, many craftsmen and women who are producing good clothes, good pottery, good furniture, good toys, good handicrafts. So there are still millions of people engaged in good work. We have to honor them, cherish them, promote them, pay them well so that they can continue to do that work. And then hopefully, if we build a movement for ecology, for environment, for sustainability, for ethical and environmental dimension of economy, then I think this movement can get bigger and bigger. When Mahatma Gandhi started Movement for Independence, it was a small movement, but it grew and grew and grew. After 30, 40 years, it became a big movement. When Martin Luther King started a movement for racial uh, equality, it was a small movement. I met him. And at that time, black people had no right to vote, at, even in 1964 when I met Marshall King. And now we have a black man in the White House. So things can change. When I went to walking to Moscow, it was a communist regime. And all over, whole of Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall. And now, where is Soviet Union? 
Where is the communist regime? Where is the Berlin Wall? Gone. So these things what we have today, sort of kind of uh, ecologically, environmentally unsustainable structures of business and economy and government, they are made by humans in the last 200 years. What is 200 years in the geological scale of time? Short. So this can be unmade. Humans are more ingenious and more imaginative and more and more idealistic and, and have a bigger picture they can embrace. So let's build that movement, support the farmers, support the craftsmen, support the builders and makers and an and ecological movement. And it's wonderful that you are giving this opportunity coming together to talk about ethical and environmental dimension of economy. It's a wonderful. Um, maybe this is quite a new thing. How many uh, accounts uh, societies are doing such thinking? So you thinking like this is a good beginning. So let's build this movement movement in the next 10, 15, 20 years, we can change our country, we can change our society with that hope, with that optimism, we have to act. Urbanization. Yes, yes, yes. No, you are very right. You are very right. Uh, we need a new understanding and a new policy which has a better balance between urban and rural. And all urban, first of all, urban, we living in urban societies should not think that somehow urban people are more advanced and more clever and better and the people living in rural areas are somehow backward and stupid and uneducated. This kind of thinking has to change. At the moment, farmers educate their children so that they don't go into farming. They say, don't go in farming. Get educated and get a no cream. Get some job, government job or business job or even a pune, even a, a guard uh, or even a lift man. Something, get a job. Don't work in the land. No money here. So this kind of mentality is promoting urbanization. It's not only government. Government is what we vote for. We have to take responsibility and we have to say what kind of thinking has led this kind of urbanization where rural people are rushing towards city uh, and Mumbai, Kolkata, Chennai, Bangalore, Delhi, whatever this, these cities are, rushing towards cities because there's no money in rural areas, there are no jobs, agriculture is poorly paid, what can they do? So it is our responsibility. We have to change our thinking. We cannot just think governments are only what we elect for. So government are responsible, but we people have to take responsibility and think that being in rural areas are as beautiful as living in Mumbai. What is so special in living in Mumbai and not so good in living in a village? Living in a village is as good as living in Mumbai, if not better. So if we have that thinking, then I think we can make some change. Honorable Sir Amit Shah, thank you so much for enlightening us. I have two questions for you. Yeah. Number one, what is the secret of your so powerful and so loving energy? And second, do we really need the GM crops? GM crops, okay. What is the secret of my energy? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, there is no secret, really. Um, anybody can have such energy. Two things. One is caring for yourself. So every day I spend some time 
intellectual work, editing, writing, speaking. But also every day I spend some time physical work, gardening, walking, something, cooking, something I do which is physical. When you are doing something physical and mental together, you are better balanced. So I have a kind of better balance in my life. Every day, at least one hour, I walk. And uh, I was already asking when I was coming here, and I, they said, Marine Drive. I said, can I go for a little walk tomorrow morning? So I'm going to ask my host, can we go for a little walk? So walking, uh, gardening, being out in nature, um, appreciating trees. So that's a kind of balance that you need for your health. Other second thing in my health, baby, is not worrying. Worries make you weak. Murray, worry, mental worry, your anger, your fear, your anxiety, your frustration, your, your, all those kind of worries and anger, that takes toll on your body as well. So if you want to be healthy and happy, try to reduce your anxiety and your worries and your fears and your, um, your doubts and your, um, your sort of greed and, and all those things which make you unhappy. A happy person in his heart or her heart and mind is also a healthy person. Happiness and health go together. I am by nature a happy person. I enjoy life. I celebrate life. Ananda is my religion. The best religion is Ananda. Jain, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, they're all by the way. The real religion for me is joy. Be happy and serve humanity. That's the kind of, that gives me passionate. Now the second question about GM crops. I think GM crop is totally undemocratic. It will take away the freedom of farmers to save their own seeds grow their own crops, which they develop. The seeds have been developed over generation after generation, over hundreds of years. And suddenly, like chemicals, fertilizers, um, suddenly one or two or five companies from America come and tell, no, 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 you are all backward. Your seeds of hundreds and hundreds of years of year developed are all backward and stupid. Like we say, villagers are stupid, farmers are stupid, and your seeds are also stupid have this tremendously uh, scientific and technological seeds, genetically engineered seeds, take them. That will put the millions of farmers in the hands of monopolistic five companies who produce GM food. Freedom is like uh, East India Company all over again. These foreign few companies coming from somewhere and saying, farmers, your seeds are no good. We have to trust the farmers. And their seeds which have been there for hundreds of years or thousands of years. The diversity is the evolution's principle. Evolution favors diversity. Industrial agriculture favors uniformity. Just four or five or ten kinds of seeds. We have seeds of thousands of varieties. Mangoes of thousands of varieties. You go to any part of India, different mangoes. Genetically engineered mangoes will be one or two or three kinds of variety. Rice, any part of season, any part of um, climate, any part of soil, they have a different rice because that suits the climate, that suits the soil, that suits uh, the, the, the people and their culture. And in that, those seeds have developed. How can we say history is bad, farmers are bad, they are all backward, they are stupid, they can't feed the world. Monsanto will feed the world, coming from America, or Cargill will feed the world. And all our universities are teaching American way of agriculture. India had, people came from England to learn about agriculture in India. There's a famous agronomist uh, man called Albert Howard, at the time of British Raj. He came and, and he was supposed to do some agricultural development and progress. And when he looked at Indian agriculture, he said, wow, the Indian farmers are so advanced. We don't have such good farming in England. And he wrote a book called Testament of Agriculture, which is a classic book. 
appreciating and praising Indian agriculture. And now our government and our industry think, oh, our farmers are no good. Their seeds are no good. They are backward. They are uneducated. These are highly educated people from America producing seeds in a laboratory, Monsanto laboratory, and take all the, it's undemocratic. All the people's lives of millions of farmers in the hands of five companies, we don't want that. So in my view, GM is undemocratic, unecological, unethical, completely wrong. I'm 100% opposed to genetically engineered seeds. I want to respect farmers. I want to respect tradition. I want them to be free, free to save their own seed. Freedom is more important. We don't want to have India colonized in the name of genetic engineering or something else. We want our farmers to be free to save their seed, to protect their seed, to develop their seed in their own culture, in their own climate, in their own soil. Let the farmers be free to produce food for everybody. young, why yes. don't have to sit because I can see everybody standing. Um, learning from my walk, a very good question. Um, first of all, how this idea came to me, there was a very wonderful old philosopher in England called Bertrand Russell. He was a Nobel Prize winning mathematician and a philosopher. At age 90, he decided to protest against the nuclear weapons. And he was protesting, demonstrating, and sit down, sit in, and, and not moving. So he was arrested. He was fined. He said, I'm not going to pay fine. If you're not going to pay fine, you'll be sent to jail. All right, I'll go to jail. He was sent to jail for seven days. I was in Bangalore, 25 years old at that time. I read this news and I said, here is a man of 90 going to jail for peace in the world. What am I doing, young man sitting here drinking coffee? Yeah. I do something for peace in the world. And so my friend E.P. Menon and I decided that we will go to Moscow, Paris, London, Washington four nuclear capitals at that time to protest against nuclear weapons, war preparation. It was the height of Cold War. And so we said, we are going to work for peace. So that was the inspiration. And then we went to Vinoba Bhave, our teacher. And he said, if you are going for peace, you have to go without any money. Because wars begin in fear. And peace begins in trust. So if you go for peace, you have to have a trust in your heart. People will look after you. You have to trust the people. You have to trust the universe. You have to trust yourself. So go with trust and depend on people. And then they will ask you questions. And you will also say you are a vegetarian. So they will say, why are you vegetarian? So your peace with nature, peace with animals is as important as peace with people. So you can talk about peace in a broad sense. So, vegetarian, without money, my friend E.P. Med and I started from Rajghat, uh, Mahatma Gandhi's um, Samadhi, and we walked to uh, Pakistan, over the Khyber Pass, Afghanistan, Iran, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia. In Georgia, I tell you one story. We were distributing leaflets, and in our leaflet, we explained that we are walking for peace, we are going without money. If anybody would like to offer us hospitality for the night, we will welcome. We are also looking for uh, so opportunities to speak in schools, universities, colleges, media, television, radio, anything. All that explained. So I, we gave this flyer to two women 
who were standing in front of a tea factory. So I gave this leaflet and these two women read it very quickly. I said, have you already, always, have you walked all the way from India? Tell us how did you do it? Tell us how was the story? Would you like, you have no money. Would you like some lunch? Would you like some tea? We are working in this tea factory. We have a nice canteen. Please come. We said, that's a very nice invitation. And any time is tea time and, and it's a lunch time, we will come. So we went in the factory. As we went in, in the canteen, the women brought us tea and some bread and some butter and cheese and we started to eat. And then suddenly, one woman had a brain wave. She went out of the room and came back with four packets of tea and said, these packets of tea are not for you. So for whom are they? I was surprised. She said, I would like you to be my ambassador and give one packet of tea to our premier in the Kremlin in Moscow. The second packet of tea to the president of France in Paris, Palace Elysee. The third packet of tea in England, Prime Minister of England, 10 Downing Street, London. Fourth packet of tea to the White House, President of the United States of America. And please give them a message for me. I was so surprised. In this little village, little tea factory in Georgia, and this woman saying, please give them a message. Take this packet of peace tea and give them a message for me. I said, what is your message? My message to them is that if you ever get a mad thought of pressing the nuclear button, please stop for a moment, have a fresh cup of tea. <laughs> and that will give you a moment to think and reflect that your nuclear weapons dropping will not only kill your enemies, but will kill men, women, children, workers, farmers, lakes, forests, animals, everything will be destroyed. Nuclear weapons are not weapons of war. They are weapons of mass destruction. So please think again and don't press the nuclear button. I was so touched. I was so inspired. I said to my friend E.P. Menon, I said, now, whatever happens, whether we have a snowstorm or or, or hunger, or we don't get any shelter, or we have rain, or we have long distances of mountains or deserts, whatever happens, we have to deliver these packets of peace tea. And we did. And we went to the Kremlin, and we went to the White House, and we went to 10 Downing Street, and we went to Palace Elysee, and one way or the other, the whole story is a long story, and I have to read my book. I have written a book called No Destination. Unfortunately, it's published only in the UK. Um, but you can get it on Amazon. Um, so I've written my story of walking. But what I learned, and I walked all the way from Moscow to Paris, 8,000 miles, 13,000 kilometers, without any money for two and a half years, and beating Bertrand Russell, beating Martin Luther King, and going to White House, going to Kremlin, all that story, amazing learning. I would not have learned about the world if I studied for five years in a university, what I learned in two years by walking every step and being grateful to Mother Earth, who is holding me and allowing me to walk on her back. So I learned about ecology. I learned about making peace with nature. I learned about making peace with animals. I learned making peace with humanity. And I learned that before you are an Indian or a Hindu or a Jain, you are a human being. Because if you go as an Indian, you meet a Pakistani or a Russian or American. If you go as a Hindu or, or Jain, you meet a Muslim or Christian or Jew or Parsi or somebody else. But if you go as a human being, you meet human beings everywhere. So it is shared humanity, the common humanity I learned. Before we are any labels of Indian or Pakistani or um, Chinese or Japanese or Russian or American or Hindu or Muslim or Christian or whatever labels we have, we are human beings. Our shared humanity is the primary identity and all other secondary identities are like icing on the cake. But the cake is humanity. So that's what I learned by walking through unknown countries, unknown languages, unknown cultures, unknown religions, 
capitalist countries, communist countries, Christian countries, Muslim countries, rich, poor, wherever you went, I met human beings. So shared humanity, shared nature, Mother Earth, this is what I learned. And I think if young person going walking, you can go everywhere. You can see the world. You don't have to say, I don't have money, how can I see the world? I don't have money, how can I go anywhere? Money is only a means to an end, it's not the boss. Your imagination, your courage, your fearlessness, that is the real wealth. So I went with courage, with trust in my heart, and I was welcomed everywhere. In the White House, in Martin Luther King's house, in Burton Russell's house, in a Shah of Iran's house, and a poor people's house. Same, no difference. Everybody. So that equality and equanimity I learned by walking around the world. Thank you. I request Mukesh uh, Bhai to present a formal word of thanks and uh, that will be really quick. Uh, but I can tell you how grateful we are that you came and spoke to us. Thank you. Before a pleasant task of a word of thanks, one very interesting and another pleasant task. We are felicitating two young, fresh, own fresh chartered accountants. They have just qualified and we would like to felicitate them. Uh, one is Umesh Kumar, Ashok Kumar Pahilan. Is he here? Please come. Uh, our uh, learned guest would like to present a memento to you and welcome Kit as a Okay. As a compliment and our tribute to you. How many presents I'm going to get? And do your child accountancy in the service of humanity and the earth and be happy. Thank you. Another is Srinath Vipul Gandhi. Friends, this young man of 80 years talking with heart, mind and soul and that is only possible when he is having what he is living the life that he talked about. And we all were sitting and he was standing and with a passion and force and complete involvement he shared few of the finest values of life. One or two important message for all of us to take home. One pot at home on the soil and plant a tree or a plant something that will be the finest tribute to this wonderful presentation of the evening. And two, respect the farmer. Whether farmer is within us, whether in this world, and every day when we are having our first morsel or a first bite, let us respect that particular man who created something for us and to fill our stomach. With this, friends, let us, let us express our gratitude with a standing ovation to this young man. We are grateful, sir, for enlivening us with a wonderful pulse of wisdom. Thank you.